thank you all. Uh, we will go ahead and get started. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties. My name is Jason Shepard. I'm the chair of the Department of Communications at Cal State Fullerton, south of Los Angeles, and I'm honored to uh, be invited to uh, moderate the first panel of the, the morning. I'd like to introduce our, our panelists. Uh, first, we have Ira Basin, a CBC reporter, a radio reporter, producer. Uh, Mark Fanuruwada, a journalist and co-author of League of Denial, the NFL Concussions and the Battle for Truth. And Walt Donovich, a New York Times reporter and Pulitzer winner. Our fourth panelist, Armin Patayan from CBS uh, 60 Minutes Sports, was one of those travel casualties. And uh, after popping around to two, two different uh, New York airports yesterday, was not able to, to uh, get his flight to Madison, uh, make a flight to Madison because of the, the rain. So he apologizes uh, for not being here uh, today. This panel is uh, looking at some ethical issues in investigative journalism as it relates to sports and challenges that uh, sports reporters uh, sometimes face when they are trying to get and report uh, facts. And so Ira Basin will begin uh, uh, the discussion. Uh, I've asked each of the panelists uh, to have about a, a 10 to, to 15 minute uh, discussion, which will then leave us uh, time for uh, lots of questions, I hope. So with that, we'll start with Ira. Maybe I try that. That might work. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me here. I went to graduate school at this university, and um, I, I love coming back here. I love this university, and I uh, deeply admire the work that um, is being done here in the, in the Center for Journalism Ethics, because I think it's, it's really important work. Um, and started by a lady. Um, and, and what I want to talk about today uh, is a slightly different um, a, approach. I, um, I, uh, in the 1980s, I started a uh, sports journalism program on uh, CCC Radio and uh, was the senior producer of that for several years. But really, since then, I haven't uh, worked very much in sports. But what I have done is uh, worked quite a bit in, uh, in the world of media and the changes that are happening in media, uh, particularly as a result of social media. And one of the things that I want to talk about today is you know, one of the great challenges that, that we as journalists face, um, which is the competition that we are facing not from each other, but from the people who we used to report on, um, a phenomenon that is generally called owned media, which I think uh, poses real challenges in terms of um, the ethics of of uh, sports journalism and, and also um, investigative reporting because the, the resources um, are, uh, when the resources are not as available as readily available and not as extensive as they used to be. So that's um, the subject that I want to talk about today. I don't have nearly the resume that these two gentlemen have and the experience that these two gentlemen have, so I, I, I don't even want to sort of travel in that uh, sphere, but I'm going to try and, and maybe um, set up the, the discussion in, a, um, in, in that way. And um, I want to start by talking about a guy who, um, in the 1960s and 70s, was a wonderful sports columnist uh, for the Toronto Globe and Mail, and his name was Dick Beddoes. And in 1970, he was asked to appear in front of a commission that the Canadian government had established to, um, to look into the question of media concentration uh, back in the days when uh, governments cared about things like that. And at one point in his present hesitation, uh, Dick Beddoes decided to unburden himself and reveal what he thought about people who wrote sports for a living. And he said that the profession is still burdened with hacks who make tin can gods out of cast iron jerks. They slant news in favor of the home team, defer to local sports management for the sake of maintaining cordial working relationships, and accept publicity handouts in place of digging for their own stories. Now this, as you can imagine, did not win him any friends among his fellow uh, scribes. A little bit later in the 1980s, when I was starting out as a freelancer, I interviewed Dick for a radio program I was producing about hockey in Canada, and I asked him what he thought the key was to being uh, a good sports writer. And his answer was, you always have to root for the story and not for the team. If Russia beating Canada in hockey was a better story than Canada beating Russia, then that is what you needed to root for. And I was thinking of Dick Beddoes, I was trying to figure out what it was I wanted to talk about today, 
As things were obviously very different back then, codes of ethics were certainly a lot looser. It was not uncommon for teams in Major League Baseball to pay the travel costs of the beat writers who covered the team, even let them ride along on the train or the plane with the players and the staff. Reporters who were favored by their teams could pick up some extra cash by doing PR work and writing puff profiles that would be published in the program that was sold in the stadium, which really, if you think about it, was the only media property that teams actually owned back then, was the program. And under those circumstances, it was harder to root for the story than for the team, and Beto's uh, characterization was perhaps not far off the mark. But over time, codes of ethics uh, that applied to other areas of journalism eventually entered the world of sports. The sports reporters and professional athletes used to make, rough, used to make roughly the same amount of money um, and come from similar backgrounds. It wasn't hard for personal bonds to develop. Of course, that's not exactly the case anymore, and the distance that now often exists between the pro athlete and the sports reporter is a good thing. We are literally not on the same team, and that's how it should be. But of course, while all this was happening, while, um, while we were adopting codes of ethics that were more akin to other areas of journalism, the landscape around us was changing dramatically. The internet removed the barriers to entry that had provided journalists working for traditional media outlets with a monopoly on who got to call themselves sports reporters. Now everyone could offer their pictures and videos and, and their stories and of course their opinions to the world. Everyone was now a publisher. And that meant, you know, the proverbial uh, um, guy sitting in his mother's basement in his pajamas was now a sports reporter and is now a, a publisher. But, and, and everybody kind of talked about that being the sort of citizen journalist, right? But what we didn't expect was that the New York Yankees and the Green Bay Packers and the University of Wisconsin Badgers would also now be in the sports media business, and that teams and leagues were now competing for eyeballs with traditional media. They had, um, they had once been partners who met each other's needs. The teams needed the publicity that the newspapers and radio and television could deliver, and the media outlets needed the teams and the athletes to provide lots of stories that would attract audiences. But it's not like that anymore. As Ted Leonsis, the owner of Washington Capitals of, of the NHL and the Wizards of the NBA declared a couple of years ago, I don't want the Washington Post to get the most clicks, I want the most clicks, and he's getting it. Leonsis is actually a pioneer in this world of sports publishing. When he bought the Capitals about 15 years ago, it was a bad team with poor attendance, and a total of one Washington Post reporter covering it. He tried to get the Post to expand their coverage, and they just told him they couldn't afford to do it. And so he turned to the blogosphere, and he gave bloggers access to the team, and suddenly he had hundreds of people covering his team. And the Capitals now sell out every game. And the Washington Post went from being a voice, to, from being the voice of the, of the Capitals to a voice, and not even the most important voice. Beyonce said, I used to live in mortal fear about what you would write, and now I don't care. And Leonsen's wasn't finished yet. In 2013, he created his own network, the Monumental Sports and Entertainment, um, where fans could learn everything they wanted to know about the Caps and the Wizards and more by checking out dozens of blogs and websites. They get about 5 million unique visitors a month. It's billed as your monumental source for sports and entertainment. I just want to show you, um, I hope, just briefly what it looks like if you've never seen this. Oh, what happened to people? Oh, you got it. Okay, sorry. Is it there? So, uh, Do we have the website to show? Oh, okay. I, I did pull it up on the computer. Oh, they took the computer. Okay. Well, I'll do it. All right. Well, if we get it, that's fine. But what's interesting about it, I mean, you should take a look at it. It's incredibly large and, and um, has dozens and dozens of different sites and blogs. And you know, it, the name itself is rather grandiose, Monumental Sports and Entertainment, and nowhere does it actually say um, this site is owned by the Washington Capitals and the Washington Wizards. And it also contains you know, dozens of affiliated sites that are not just about the teams that, that he owns, but also about the Orioles and the Nationals and the, and the, uh, the Ravens. Um, so Baltimore and Washington sports in general. So his two teams still lose money, but uh, he hopes that, that Monumental will help turn that around. Leonsens believes that those sites will soon be generating significant ad revenue in addition to promoting his teams. And of course that ad revenue is, is ad revenue that might once have gravitated to the sports section of the local newspaper. And if I was a fan of the Washington Capitals or the Wizards or any other Washington or Baltimore team, I'd probably be a big fan of the Monumental Network. 
Okay. <laughs> Um, it has lots to offer me in terms of exclusive access to my favorite players. It would probably be the first place, in the, uh, first place that I would learn about trades, and I can even get to chat with the owner. And meanwhile, the Washington Post continues to struggle to enhance its sports coverage, but has nowhere near the resources Leonsis has to compete. So that's it. Um, I'll see if I can scroll down. So if you, it's not the same page I had yesterday. Um, let me see what we can find here. Yeah, so you can see that there's, um, there's a, um, a newsroom page and there's, um, Lots of different uh, blogs and everything else, stories about the Capitals. But again, what's sort of interesting is the official home of the Washington Capitals. Um, what's interesting is that on the home page of uh, Monumental Sports, it, it doesn't say anywhere that, um, uh, that it is owned by the, by the Capitals. Um, these are all the different affiliated sites that they have. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's really um, quite extensive. And as I say, if I was a fan, of the Capitals or the Wizards, this would be so, this would be the first place I would go for the for the information. Certainly more so than whatever the Washington Post would be able to uh, to offer me. Now, Mark Cuban is another guy who's a real pioneer. He's the controversial billionaire owner of the of the NBA's Mavericks, um, Dallas Mavericks, and um, again, he's another pioneer in this relationship between the people who have traditionally uh, covered sports and the teams. And Cuban believes that the TV and newspaper reporters. TV and newspaper reporters do have a place in the Mavs locker room because they reach fans who don't get sports news online. And, and also the Mavs don't own TV or uh, stations or newspapers. But the Mavs do have a very active online presence. And Mark Cuban doesn't believe that online reporters or bloggers, paid or unplaced, unpaid, have any place in the dressing room. He believes all they're looking to do is generate a lot of, generate a lot of traffic and like Ted Leonsis, he thinks he should be getting those clicks himself. But whereas Leonsis re reaches out to, reached out to those people, to those bloggers to promote his teams, Cuban wants to ban them. He thinks that they get their traffic by reporting gossip and rumors and being excessively negative, and negative stories waste a lot of time for the teams and the coaches. He wrote, I'm a firm believer that those bloggers' interests are not only are not, only not aligned with sports teams like the Mavs, but in fact, they are diametrically opposed. It appears that Mark Cuban believes that the main job of reporters is to produce content that is favorable to the team. He wondered, by competing with them as an information source, can we preempt their negativity with information that does a better job of selling the Mavs? Mark Cuban is a very smart guy, but he really does seem to think that reporters who cover his team, reporters who cover his team, should be in the business of making cast iron heroes out of tin can jerks. Now, sports teams and media companies have a long history together. The Chicago Tribune, of course, owned the Cubs for a very long time. The New York Times owned parts of the Red Sox. In Toronto, both the Maple Leafs and the Raptors are owned, at least in part, by Canada's two biggest media giants, Bell and Rogers. And when Disney bought, brought NHL hockey to Anaheim, they called the team the Mighty Ducks in what was, in effect, one giant product placement for a series of movies of the same name. And while the potential conflicts of interest in those situations are obvious, obvious, the reality is in all those cases, there's actually very little evidence of actual interference by those media companies and how their reporters have covered their teams. These were very, these were very large pre-existing companies and they added those teams as part of their corporate portfolios. But the world we're in today is quite different. It was the team that came first and the media company was created specifically to support that team. And I'm not just talking about teams who are owning the broadcast rights to their games, as we see in Toronto, New York, Boston, and elsewhere. What's interesting about monumental sports in Washington is that it doesn't even have the rights to broadcast the Capitol and the Wizards games. Those are owned by Comcast, although that will likely change when their contract expires in a few years. But what we're dealing with here are media companies with very large resources and very smart owners whose stated mission is to replace traditional media as the primary source of news and information about their teams. And this, is what's hap and this is happening at a time when the resources that traditional media can devote to sports coverage and everything else are shrinking dramatically. 
is also happening at a time when trust in the credibility of traditional media is also shrinking. Ted Leonson recently posted on his blog on monumental sport, sports the result of the latest Gallup poll that looked at how Americans viewed traditional media. Gallup found that only 40% of, <clears throat> of respondents said they had trust in the media to fully, accurately, and, re and fairly report the news. That was the lowest level of trust ever recorded. In 2003, that number was 54%. Today is 40%. Now, those people weren't thinking of sports reporting when they answered that question about trust, but the reality is that these days, people are growing increasingly indifferent as to where their content is coming from. And while, and while in our minds, there might be a significant difference between stories pr produced by the Wisconsin State Journal or the Mo Milwaukee Journal Sentinel or the New York Times, and stories produced by the Milwaukee Brewers or Major League Baseball or the University of Wisconsin, in the minds of a growing number of people, especially young, younger people, those differences are not all that significant. This is a hard reality for many journalists to face, and we should perhaps be doing a better job of explaining to people why that difference matters. But the reason why brands, including sports teams and leagues, have successfully made the transition into media companies is because they do it well and because people see them as a trusted source of content. But are these sites really trusted sources of content? Will NFL.com break the concussion story or stories of sexual assault by players? Will MLB.com break stories about players using performance enhancing drugs? Will they do that kind of investigative work? No, they will not. Will they report on it? Actually, yes, they will. The people running these sites and the people writing for them are not hacks. Many of them have, have had and continue to have respected careers in sports journalism. And these sites know that to attract readers, they need to provide compelling content, and they cannot come across as corporate shills. If you're going to compete against traditional media sites, you need to behave as much like a traditional media site as you possibly can, within the obvious limitations imposed by the fact they are not there to do neutral, independent journalism. But then again, neutral, independent journalism is a commodity that is increasingly hard to find, even in the mainstream, given the many breaches in the previously impenetrable wall that once existed between, between advertising and editorial in the traditional media. And so I really just want to end by talking about what I think some of the challenges are going forward, and then my two colleagues here can give you some uh, more specific examples. But um, I, I think that, that one of the big challenges is where does traditional media fit within this, this uh, landscape, this very uh, changing landscape, uh, quickly changing landscape? What is it that we have to offer that, um, that can't be offered by monumental sports and these other owned media sites? And I think clearly, you know, one of the answers to that is that we have to, to uh, ramp up our ability to do uh, investigative work because they're not going to do it and that by default leaves it to us. And of course, that's an enormous challenge in a, at a time when, uh, when the resources available to many mainstream um, journalism outlets uh, to do that kind of investigative work is, is, is simply not there. Um, how are we going to, to compete against these sites? How are we going to be able to convince uh, readers that, that there is something to be offered, that, that we have something to offer that they cannot, simply cannot get elsewhere? elsewhere? And, and these ethical challenges that, that uh, you know, resulting from, um, from the blurring of the lines between, between advertising and editorial and the, these compromises that, you know, native advertising and these compromises that are, are, um, are continually um, being made. And so finally, you know, I, I think about what Dick Beto said about, um, about you know, turning uh, um, tin can heroes, uh, sorry, cast iron jerks into tin can heroes and, you know, how much of that, and, and that is still, you know, in some ways, the, the business of, of, you know, monumental sports and these other own media properties, and that's, that's the thing that we, um, that's the point of differentiation that we have, and that's, that's the point of, of differentiation that we need to continue to highlight and we, can, we need to continue to, to pour our resources into um, as we move into this world where people that formerly were our partners are now our competitors. Uh, next, we'll hear. <laughs> next, we'll, we'll hear from Mark Van Ruwada. Um, so, uh, I, first, I just want to thank uh, uh, Wisconsin for, for having me for the university. I, uh, I was remembering as I was walking over here from the hotel years ago, too many years ago. Uh, 
uh, I visited Madison looking at colleges and, and looking at the J School as a possible um, option for me. And sadly, I didn't choose it. But, uh, but I remember just loving uh, this town and, and knowing a lot of people who came through the program and, and, um, and feeling good about it. So I feel really flattered to be asked to, to, come, to come here to speak. Um, I, I'm going to tell a, a, a tale that, that I've told a, a few times, which is maybe why I don't have notes. Um, although probably more because it's etched in my brain so deeply as, as a traumatic event. Um, I'm going to tell you the story of what happened when um, a traumatic event that ends up actually very positive, I will say. Um, so, so Jason mentioned uh, the, this work, League of Denial. Um, and League of Denial was a, a book, started as a book project with my brother um, and, and colleague at ESPN, Steve Fainaru. He's the true stud of the family, a Pulitzer winner like Walt. Um, and and uh, we, we started to work on a project that looked at um, the issue of, of the concussion crisis, essentially, in the NFL. Um, and, and from a perspective that really, frankly, nobody had looked at the story in an aggressive way, which was, what did the NFL know and when did it know it? How did it look at the science? How did it attack the science? What did it do to those who had raised questions about a possible link between football and brain damage? And, um, and we saw a really interesting narrative there, and Steve and I had always wanted to work on a project together, and so we, we, uh, we were fortunate enough to, to sell a book project, and we started to work on it. And, and at ESPN, we work on a unit, um, it's an enterprise and investigations unit at ESPN. Um, it is arguably, I don't, you know, I, I don't have numbers to back it up, just anecdotally I would say it's arguably the, the largest investigative unit in the country, and I think that's not just sports. Um, there's a lot of people at ESPN across all platforms doing investigative work. Um, and so we, uh, we launched this project, and at the same time we were doing it, um, we, uh, we, we had full support of everybody, uh, our bosses at ESPN and our unit. And in fact, the, the discussion throughout this project as we started to do the reporting and dug deeper and deeper into it was that um, as we found newsworthy stories, we would break those pieces off for ESPN um, and they would air on the network, and they would run on the website. Um, and, and at the same time that was happening, the PBS program Frontline decided we knew somebody there and had started a conversation, and they expected, expressed an interest in doing a documentary based on the reporting that we were doing on League of Denial. And so what emerged uh, was a partnership, a large partnership, uh, an incredible partnership, really, of journalism power between ESPN and our unit, and uh, the folks at Frontline who do, I, I think, not many people would argue the best investigative journalism on television. And, um, and so we created this partnership. ESPN embraced the partnership, becoming a co-producer of the documentary. Um, Frontline would do all the documentary work because that's what they do. Um, we would be reporters and uh, um, we, would be, we would be identified as reporters and writers on the documentary. Um, and we would be throughout the documentary, and Frontline would produce that part of it based on the reporting Steve and I were doing uh, for the book. And so for 15 months, this just amazing partnership developed in which we produced story after story, I think upwards of nine to 10 stories um, over about a year and a half, uh, maybe 15 months, um, for ESPN uh, that would air on Outside the Lines, which is our sort of uh, you know, 60 minutes for sports, for lack of a better description. Um, it's our long-form TV program. And, uh, and on ESPN.com, several breaking stories. We broke a big story um, that, that really identified how far back the NFL had actually acknowledged in some documents um, the link between brain damage and football um, while still publicly denying that. Um, that story bounced in huge ways for us. Um, and, um, and a number, a series of other stories. And, and Frontline, of course, loved the relationship because um, ESPN's reach, as you probably know, is just obscene. And so on the website, you saw uh, the stories that were on ESPN.com getting linked to Frontline and Fr Frontline's website exploding with, with, uh, with, um, with viewers, with users. So it was a, it was a relationship that was, um, was working perfectly. And, and throughout the company, there was a sort of celebration of this, of this unique partnership. Um, so fast forward now to about a few months before the book and the documentary are about to come out. And uh, Steve, uh, Steve and I were at home sort of finishing up the last pieces of the book. 
Um, not the same. He's always, he's always quick to point out we're not at the same home anymore. We're not, we're not in bunk beds. We're, we are in the Bay Area together, but we're not, we're not in bunk beds anymore. Um, but we, uh, we're in the Bay Area. We're finishing up the project, and we got a call from our bosses um, who, who sort of very formally tell us that ESPN is pulling out of the documentary, taking its name off the documentary. And um, needless to say, this was a shocking turn of events for, for the two of us. Um, troubling on a number of levels. And uh, um, we, beyond panicking, we immediately made plans to go back to Bristol, meet with our bosses to try and find out what was going on. And ESPN's public position was um, that this was not uh, uh, something that ESPN had editorial control over. And so uh, it was going to take its name off of the documentary. And I think for, for myself and for Steve, that was a puzzling response given that, of course, we were identified as ESPN reporters throughout the documentary. We were writers and reporters in the documentary, and it was based largely, almost entirely, on the reporting that we'd been doing. Um, there was another ESPN reporter in the documentary as well, Peter Keating, who'd done fantastic work on this topic. So the, the, the concept that this was not an ESPN project was hard to sort of piece, pull apart. Um, so we went back to Bristol, and we met with our bosses, and there amidst great concern from people in our unit, um, particularly after, um, shortly after this happened, Walt's paper, that's what I call it, Walt's paper, not the New York Times. Uh, the New York Times reported that uh, um, uh, the commissioner of the NFL, Roger Goodell, had met with the head of ESPN, John Skipper, and uh, complained about the book and the documentary. And, and one of the complaints, of course, not surprisingly, was the title, League of Denial. Um, as you can imagine, not the most popular title. And, and one of the things that had happened that had preempted or prompted perhaps this, this sort of uh, uh, huge, as we like to call it, implosion, was that uh, when we were in LA for a period of time, right around this, um, uh, uh, promote, the documentary was being promoted and released, and a, a trailer for the documentary came out. And the trailer obviously showed the title, League of Denial, and it also showed a woman named Ann McKee, arguably the foremost authority on research around concussions and the NFL and brain trauma, um, saying she was concerned that every single football player was going to end up having this issue. So as you can imagine, that was not a popular message for the NFL to hear. Um, and so the Times reports that subsequent to that, Goodell and Skipper meet, and subsequent to that, ESPN pulls its name off of the documentary. So it's in that context that Steve and I fly back to Bristol with great concern about, frankly, whether we can keep working at ESPN. Um, to that point, we'd had just an amazing experience, both of us working there, um, the full support of our bosses, um, and uh, never had a story touched. And, um, and so we went back with that concern and the concern that was shared by the people in our unit. Again, it's a really large unit meetings going on, phone conversations, and everybody expressing great concern about the message that's being sent about journalism at ESPN. And of course, this is the elephant in the room at ESPN, obviously. When anybody criticizes ESPN, among other things, this is the big one. Well, you're in bed with the NFL because you have these massive television contracts, the kinds of relationships that I was just talking about. So um, as we were in Bristol, we met with a lot of executives, including John Skipper, to try and find out what all this meant. And the message to us was, look, uh, this is not a journalism decision. This is a corporate decision that's about control. And um, we're taking the brand name off of the documentary. And, uh, and in the end, um, we're going to do exactly what we've said we were going to do all along, which is we're going uh, to run excerpts of the book. We're going to run excerpts of the documentary on Outside the Lines. Um, and you guys are going to end up, for newsworthy purposes, on shows talking about the material that you've got in your, in your book and on the, in the documentary. Um, and that's what's going to happen when the book and the film come out. And in the end, that's exactly what happened. And this is, I, I always say, you know, this is going to start to come out as defensive, but this is one of those cases where two things can be true at the same time. And while it was a troubling experience on many levels from a journalistic standpoint, for us, in the end, um, the journalism won. Um, ESPN did, in fact, run a long excerpt of the book on ESPN.com. Uh, ESPN did run two long excerpts of the documentary on Outside the Lines. We were on 
uh, dozens or I don't know how many programs across the platform of ESPN, the billion networks, billion stations that we have, um, and, uh, and talking about the work. Um, and then subsequently continuing to cover the story, I, I would say humbly stronger than anybody else. Nobody else was covering as aggressively the concussion story in the way we were. And we were told to continue covering that in the way we always had. And, um, and so, you know, I, I always came to look at this as, um, you know, as an instructive, difficult, troubling period, certainly, um, to go through at the same time um, feeling confident because in the end, the journalism won. And I think as Ira just pointed out, you know, these relationships exist all over the place. I mean, I was just, I was just noting, um, beyond the ones that Ira talked about, um, you know, Pointer's newspaper, the Tampa, the Tampa Bay paper, just announced recently a relationship with the University of Southern Florida in which they were now sponsoring their sports teams. Well, Pointer, of course, is the sort of bastion of journalism in, in, in terms of education and, and, um, and, and, and perhaps considered a watchdog. And yet, at the same time, Pointer has established this relationship. And the, they're there. They're, not, they're unavoidable. Um, there's no doubt that as we were reporting on our book, people from the NFL were calling our bosses and complaining. And yet, time and again, uh, those complaints were either sheltered from us, they were, they were sort of relayed as like, is this a concern about a story you've got? Are there any issues? Um, the answer was no, and the stories ran. So, um, you know, I, I always I, I tell the story because I do think it's an important story to tell about these partnerships and these relationships that exist. Um, but I also tell it um, continuing with great pride working for ESPN because the reality is um, despite these tangled relationships that exist, um, we're still aggressively covering these things arguably as much as anybody, you know, suing the University of Texas where there's a Texas Longhorn Network for uh, public documents, suing uh, Big Ten schools, suing SEC schools for documents. Um, this is an aggressive tack that ESPN is taking repeatedly. Um, before I finish, I just have to tell one uh, semi-unrelated story because I just think it, Ira was talking about how, as journalists, as sports writers, you sort of root for the, the, the story and not the game, I mean, not the team. And I, I always thought this was best illustrated. I covered baseball for a period of time, among other things. And if you've never been in a baseball press box, it's the most instructive thing. Because if you sit in a baseball press box, I'll give you San Francisco, for example, since that's where I'm from, the Bay Area. So uh, during the game, writers, you know, especially a night game, writers are on deadline. So everybody is basically feverishly writing throughout the game. There's a lot of chatter in the early innings between reporters and things like that. But as the game progresses, it gets quieter and quieter in the press box, and there's less and less talking going on. And by the seventh or eighth inning, everybody's like this. And nobody's really looking up. Um, everybody's just watching, sort of at, you know, listening a little bit and, and catching ball games. So what you'll see is here's an example of how you're rooting for the story. The Giants are trailing three to two in the bottom of the ninth in San Francisco. And, um, and up comes Buster Posey. Um, and there's two outs. And by this time, everybody has written their lead that the Giants have lost three to two. Buster Posey hits a two run home run. And I guarantee you that every person in that press box is not cheering, of course, because Buster has now given the Giants a four to three victory. They are going, oh, they're swearing their heads off because now they are scrambling with very little time to trash the top of their story and rewrite as feverishly, feverishly as they can. The only worst scenario is if Buster hits a solo home run, because then it's 3-3 and now we're going extra innings, and everybody's pissed off because they're not getting out to leave and actually go home or go get a beer. That's my story. <laughs> And uh, last, we'll hear from Walt Donovich of the New York Times. I found these notes on the floor, so I'll just read them. <laughs> <laughs> it might be about sports, it might not, but we'll find out. Um, I love sports. Uh, particularly, I love baseball. Uh, I'm Walt Bogdanich but I was born Walter Bogdanich. I took the name Walt because when I was five years old, my favorite ba baseball player was Walt Dropo. So I wanted to be known as Walt. Well, I almost had a dream come true in the 1970s when I was offered a spot covering the Cleveland Indians at the Cleveland Press. This was a dream. 
I mean, all, anyone who covered this team was totally burned out. So burned out that they had to manufacture storylines because everyone knew the end of the story was that they would lose. So I remember in the early edition of the Cleveland Press, there was a big story about their playing Toronto and the sports writer burned out, tired, wrote, you know, this is the Battle of Lake Erie, you know? And uh, eventually some copy editor looked at a map and said, well, you know, you know Toronto's not on Lake Erie. <laughs> and so they quickly tore it up and, you know, did something else. So uh, fast forward, uh, I guess you could say that my sports write, the sports writing phase of my life began in 2006 when the racehorse Barbaro broke down in the Preakness after winning the Kentucky Derby. The whole nation followed efforts to, to save that horse. Extraordinary, heroic measures were taken. Normally, you just put those horses down when they break, break down, usually on, on, on the track itself. Well, reading these articles, I too got caught up with, with following, is this horse going to live? And, and I'm not a horse person, but the, literally the whole nation was swept up in this thing. And I read one article, actually read a couple of articles that made a point that said that racehorses in America break down at twice the rate in the United States than they do in Europe. Good question, which I felt needed an answer. A lot had been written about horse racing, but I didn't think in a definitive way that an investigative reporter with access to data, knowledge of computers and how to use them, you know, could tell this story. I wanted to know how big the problem was. I wanted to know why they were breaking down. I wanted to know where they were breaking down. I wanted to know whether drugs were part of the problem. Big obstacle in doing a story like this was the fact that every state regulated that had horse racing regulated it differently. There was no central place I could go to to collect this information. So what we did is we found a way to devise a computer program to analyze tens of thousands of races. Um, it was difficult, it took time, but we did it. Um, and as a result of that, I went on my first reporting assignment away from my desk, away from the numbers, away from the data, away from the Freedom of Information Act, out into the field, finally. And I was going to the track that had the worst uh, record in the country, in New Mexico. And on my first day in the sixth race, horse broke down, threw the jockeys head first into the ground, broke his neck, put him on a ventilator. First, first day reporting. Now, I was there because we had done the spade work. You could say I was lucky, well, unlucky, but, you know, as a reporter, that's what we deal with. But we put ourselves in a position to be lucky. I went and interviewed him in the, in the hospital, and uh, it was uh, really an incredible experience, sad experience. Uh, he just died last week. Uh, never got off the ventilator. Well, you know, I would have thought other racing riders would have flocked to the, to the assignment of, of looking into incidents like this, to feel some degree of sympathy for the family, for the jockeys. Uh, but it was, it was really au contraire, that's not what happened. What happened is they attacked me. Um, they attacked the newspaper. Um, Any time a report, I, I've been in this business a long time, I know that any time you report on an institution, that is so important to the people who are around it, in this case, the insular world of, of horse racing, uh, you, you're gonna get a blowback. I expect that. I expected editorials, you know, bellicose editorials attacking us. I mean, I, that's generally what happens when I write a story, so I'm, I'm, I, I, I accept that and expect it. But in this case, these were personal attacks, uh, l large, segment of the racing committee, the racing writers attacked me. That I guess I didn't expect. Um, and what they did is they wrote these stories that distorted and misrepresented what we had reported. And they did it without ever calling us for comment. And I thought, what a unique way of doing business. Uh, it's a lot easier that way. If a story has two sides, you just report one side and, uh, you know, and you're done. Um, 
A respected blogger and reporter printed dis, you know, uh, dishonest, hysterical comments from industry insiders, accusing us of all sorts of transgressions. I complained. His response was, well, we're an open forum. You know, it's not my job to divine the truth here. My job is to give everybody a say. And I said, even if it's dishonest, even if it hasn't been reported, even if you have reason to believe it's not true, well, he's got a business. He needs clicks, and this is how he got them. This was not the first time uh, I've seen the anger of sports writers up close. As a lark, back when I was at the Wall Street Journal, I decided to look into rumors that I had heard about uh, golf riders. Now, this was a great assignment. Go to a golf course and you know, hang around and see what goes on. And what goes on really kind of did surprise me. It was, I went to Jack Nicklaus's uh, memorial tournament. And I just figured I'll sit and see you know, how they go about their business. And, and I, I sat in there, and uh, the, the golfers are out there golfing. And I'm sitting around, looking around, you know, where is everybody? Well, maybe they're out, you know, out on the course, following these guys around. Well, it turned out that ex many of them were not. Uh, many of them were, in fact, out golfing. Um, and, uh, courtesy of the tournament sponsors. Um, sitting in there alone, um, I saw the sandwiches and the beer and everything brought in there. And I also saw later in the day, when the deadlines were approaching, how tournament officials had done the interviews with the, the players as they came in off the course. And they typed them up and put them in a stack. And the reporters, after, you know, dusting off their golf shoes or whatever after coming back after a day out, out on the links, not covering but playing, they picked up the reports and wrote their stories. I was not a popular guy. Uh, I remember one story the Golf Digest writer told me. He said uh, about golfers getting all this free equipment, free trips you know, to resorts. Um, and they said, well, we went to this one resort in the Caribbean that was starting up and Golfers had four days of free golf, free meals, all this kind of stuff. And the only thing that was expected of them was to listen to the, turn, to the resort owner um, talk about his place on the last day at the final dinner. But he made a big mistake. He said, well, when this is all over, you can get some free shirts here at the, the tables up in, in front here. And at that moment, you could hear the forks dropping on the plates and everybody rushing into the tables, you know, arguing, where's the medium? Oh, I got a large. Uh, at any rate, this is the story that the Golf Digest reporter told me. Um, I've never seen more anger, though, um, in a way that I just couldn't fathom when I started reporting on the misconduct of Florida State football players. Um, I've gotten death threats. They continue today. I mean, I wrote these stories a year ago. They continue almost every day. The passion of fans, the importance of Florida State football to that city of Tallahassee can't be overstated. All you need to do is look at the fact that the booster club with hundreds of millions of dollars pays part of the president's salary, the president of the university's salary, a booster club which is exempt from freedom of information uh, access. So they've rigged it in the, in the state so that that information is not available. Even though it's nonprofit, we should be able to get a lot of that, but we can't. So um, looking at that, um, I went on to report the failure of local police to investigate allegations of misconduct, including sexual assault, domestic violence, criminal mischief, stolen property, hit and run. In, in this, during last season, two starting cornerbacks were out in the middle of the night, driving around, and got involved in a head-on collision, and both cars were totaled. The players were at fault. The driver, who was a player, um, was at fault. And they fled into the darkness, ran away. And the police were called. Um, the you know, Florida State cops came. And eventually they came back. Eventually. And they weren't tested for alcohol. They were sent home. 
cars were towed. Nothing was written. Nothing was written about it locally. We wrote about it. And again, we were criticized. And the, the local sports editor was egging on through Twitter those who were saying all these nasty things about the New York Times coming in to their community, these outsiders, coming in to embarrass the community. Well, you know, it was reasonable to think that at three in the morning, the reason they ran was because they'd been drinking. Well, they were never tested, and as it happened um, recently, that same, one of that, the same cornerback who was driving that evening was recently arrested for DUI in Tallahassee. And all the national media reported that the, that the New York Times had revealed this earlier incident. The local paper did not. The local paper had never even reported that original incident. Um, this type of um, uh, problem that I'm describing obviously goes beyond sports. I mean, the human lives are at stake here. Uh, if you have, if, you, if you're drinking and driving, you could kill somebody and had the local media joined us or had it done its own reporting, they would have actually ended up doing a favor for this player, just as they would have done favors for others who had been engaged in misconduct by highlighting it, and maybe then they could get help, and then maybe this incident wouldn't happen on the eve of the draft where this cornerback is expected to go in the first round. These are serious issues, and I see my time is up, so I'm going to scoop back to my, uh, my chair. So we have a, a few minutes for uh, questions. Dave here has a microphone. Uh, do I see any hands? Uh, one in the back. Uh, two questions. Good, good speeches, by the way. Appreciated them. Uh, one for Ira, one for Mark. Ira, do you think that in an age of hyper-capitalism like the one we live in, that traditional reporting roles are essentially doomed as the race to the bottom continues to get more and more money? And then, Mark, do you think, based on your knowledge of ESPN, do you think the next league of denial will even get off the ground? Well, I think, um, I think that, that at, um, they better not be doomed for the reasons that you've just heard. I mean, you know, the, the story about the concussions in the NFL, the story about, about you know, uh, racetracks and what was, what was happening at the racetracks, I mean, you know, they could only be done by, um, you know, reporters in the old-fashioned way working for organizations that will, would allow them the freedom uh, and the independence to do those kinds of stories. So, um, no, it, it simply can't be doomed because, you know, uh, you know, the stakes are very high. It certainly is more challenging um, for a variety of reasons, you know, some of which, which I outlined, which is that, that um, there is competition coming from, from you know, different places. Um, there are people, other actors who are now on the stage that are sinking tremendous resources into it. And even within the, the, the framework of traditional media, there are enormous challenges that, that exist because of, of you know, the, the, the crunch on resources and the blurring of the line between editorial and, and, um, and advertising. But, no, I, I, don't think, I don't think that the role of the traditional reporter is doomed, but I think that, that um, it, it, it certainly is more challenging. So I think in answer to your question without, without sounding, well, I know I'm going to come across as sounding defensive, but I'll, I will anyway. Um, you know, the, the, the reality of the project is it happened, right? I mean, the, the journalism won in the end. So will ESPN partner in another documentary based on some sort of similar investigation? I don't have any idea. I mean, that's way above my pay grade, obviously. But the reporting itself by us and our unit, that's going to keep getting done. Um, again, I, you know, I've been there for seven years now. And, and one of the concerns, frankly, I had when I went to ESPN and left print, you know, which was a beloved place to me. I love print. I still feel like a newspaper person just by being at ESPN for seven years. Um, one of the great concerns was, would we be able to do unfettered reporting? And 
you know, I'm seven years in and I've never had a story touched or changed um, as an influence by, uh, by some sort of institution. So, you know, we're still covering all of these stories as aggressively as we ever did. The unit is as big as it's ever been. And, um, you know, and we've, you know, when you're hiring somebody like my brother, when you're hiring Don Van Atta, um, you know, that's, that's sending a message of serious commitment to doing the kind of investigative journalism that, frankly, most places can't do anymore because uh, financially it's incredibly limited. Other questions? So, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't have any idea, frankly, is the answer. Like, I, you know, again, well above my pay grade. And, uh, you know, I think we, we did what we needed to do from the beginning, which was we were incredibly transparent about what we were doing, both with the league, frankly. I mean, I, you know, we met with the league very early on to tell them exactly what the project was and seek their cooperation and ask them to give us people. And, of course, they gave us nothing. And um, so they knew from the very onset what the project was and what we were trying to look at. Um, from an ESPN standpoint, um, you know, we told our bosses, who told their bosses, and it moved way up the food chain. Whether there's anything that would have ultimately changed things in the end, I don't have any idea. One more question. Um, so you're working for pretty big foot organizations, New York Times, ESPN. Um, come into uh, you know, Florida State and, and start you know, pushing your story, you're not subject to the same, I guess, you know, pol local politics that the local newspapers are. And I guess my question is, you know, those of us who work in local markets are always subject to these pressures. And at what point do you think it's appropriate to start actually reporting on those pressures, perhaps as a way of getting out well, I think we should be reporting on them. I mean, it's, I guess that's where maybe the ombudsman comes in if your paper has one or news organization has one. Yeah, there's tremendous pressures. I, I, I understand what it's like to be a local reporter because I didn't always work for Walt's newspaper. <laughs> I, I worked for a lot of small ones that were, you know, struggling to survive. Um, but, you know, I, I really didn't expect that when I went into Florida State that that university, with its layers of public relations experts and PR people, would feel the need to hire a crisis management team to deal with me specifically, made up of former investigative reporters who had gone to the dark side. And um, that was challenging. And these investigative reporters who, have, for the, all their careers, had, had fought for openness and, and transparency, all of a sudden said, canceled all the interviews that I had previously arranged and said I could only talk to them and they would only talk to me off the record. Look, you know, it's a money machine. Um, sports and money, sports and politics, we know what happens when the, when the two get come together. I was going to say one quick less, thing, one, one, one really quick thing on this point is, that, and I was saying this earlier, one of my original sports editors, Glenn Crevier here, is here from the, he was my sports editor in Santa Rosa and is now in Minneapolis. And we were talking earlier, and I was saying to him, I think one of the, one of the most important things for the work is, is the sort of strength of the editors I've had along the way. And I, I can't underscore the value of having people supporting your work and the importance of it. Like if, you know, and, and so I think that's a key, is you've got to get everybody to buy in from the start. And so you know, we had, when I was doing steroids at the Chronicle in San Francisco, and we had the venom of the, of the giants you know, and fans everywhere on us, you know, there was never wavering from the editor, my sports editor, the investigative editor, and I, I just think that's critical to the reporting, and that, that was true throughout our reporting on League of Denial. Well, in the interest of keeping us on time, uh, I'm going to uh, wrap up uh, this panel. I want to thank all three of our panelists for an excellent introduction to the day.